Hello. In this video, we're going to look at a proof of the mean value theorem. Now, this theorem is super important. It underlies a lot of the calculus that goes on from here. It's a very nice theorem that wraps in the continuous and differentiable and many of the things we looked at in the course. And this is a very important theorem in mathematics. So that's why I've labeled it super important, uh, the mean value theorem. So what does the mean value theorem say? Well, let's start with fx and let's let it be a continuous function on the closed interval a to b and differentiable on the open interval a to b. If we have those two conditions, then there exists a number c in a b such that f prime c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. This is the algebraic version of saying that the slope of the secant line, because that's what this is right here, is equal to the slope of the tangent line at some point c in the interval. Now let's take a look at the proof. So we're going to start off by supposing that we have a continuous and differentiable function. So suppose fx is continuous on closed interval a b and differentiable on an open interval a to b. Well the next step is to consider that function we talked about last class. We're going to consider g of x, which we defined to be the difference, the vertical difference between the function and its secant line. So we call that f of x minus f of a minus, and then remember we have f of b minus f of a over b minus a times x minus a. So that's the function that is the difference between the actual function and the secant line. So we subtract off the secant line. Now let's go ahead and look at g of x. In particular, the secant line, this portion right here, is a line. Are lines continuous and differentiable? Well, of course, they're a line. They're connected and they're smooth. And here's the original function. Is the original function continuous and differentiable? Well, of course, it's assumed to be continuous and differentiable. And if you have two functions that are continuous, the difference of them is continuous. You have, uh, you have two functions that's differentiable, the difference is differentiable. That comes from the limit laws, because the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits, and the derivative of a difference is the difference of the derivatives. So we can state that since g of x is the difference of two continuous and differentiable functions so since this is true g of x is continuous on closed interval a to b and differentiable on the open interval a to b. All right, so apparently g of x is also continuous and differentiable. How does that help us? Well, just for fun, let's investigate g of a. What would happen if we plugged in a to the function g of x? So if we look back here, well, Everywhere you see an x replaced by a, so there's going to be an a in here, there's going to be an a in here. All these other parts are constant, so they don't change. So g of a would equal f of a minus f of a minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a times a minus a. Well, a minus a is 0, so this whole term goes to 0. And f of a minus f of a goes to 0. So this whole thing just equals to 0. And that should make sense because if we remember from the visualization, the vertical difference between the function and its secant line at the very left endpoint is 0. There's no difference. The function and its secant line are right at the same point. So what do you predict is going to happen for g of b if we plug in b? Think about it. What's the difference between the function and its secant line 
at the right endpoint. Well, we get f of b minus f of a minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a times b minus a. Well, b minus a and b minus a can cancel out. So we get f of b minus f of a. We've got to watch that negative. It'll become negative f of b and then positive f of a because the negative distributes. Well, we've got f of b, negative f of b. We've got positive f of a, negative f of a. In the end, we just have another zero. And again, that should make sense to you if you imagine the graph in its secant line at the far other endpoint. Well, there's no difference between the two of them. So the distance would be zero. But now here's the amazing thing. G of x is continuous. It's differentiable. And at both endpoints, we have the value zero. Isn't zero the same then at the endpoints? It is. This means that g of x has the same y value at the two endpoints. And what does that mean? Well, it means we can apply Rolle's theorem. So since g of a is equal to zero, is equal to g of b, we can apply Rolle's theorem. And what does Rolle's theorem tell us? Well, Rolle's theorem says that if you have a continuous and differentiable function with equal endpoints, then, so we'd say thus, there exists a C in the interval A to B, such that, well, Rolle's theorem tells us that there has to be a point where the tangent line is horizontal, where the derivative is zero. Huh. Okay, so we know that g prime of c is zero somewhere. Well, let's go ahead and calculate g prime. Now, looking back at our function, it's a little tricky. When we do the derivative, the derivative of f will be f prime. The derivative of f of a, that'll be gone. This is all a constant, and so this just sits there, and we go, okay, what's the derivative? Just bypass the constant. Oh, here's an x. The derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of a is 0. So the derivative of this whole thing will be f prime minus this thing. So, g prime of x is equal to f prime of x. Subtract f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And we know that g prime of c, which would be equal to f prime of c, minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a should be equal to zero. So all we have to do is move this over to the right hand side and we get f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And we're done, we have proved the mean value theorem. And what's so interesting is we use Rolle's theorem to prove the mean value theorem, they kind of go hand in hand. Rolle's theorem goes first, and it provides the building blocks to actually prove the mean value theorem. Now, we're going to look at Desmos again on this to really hammer home the point, and we'll talk about a, an analogy to help you understand the mean value theorem. So if we look back at this Desmos interactive we had before, here's the function, here's the secant line, and here is the vertical distance. So if you notice, Clearly, this new function g of x is starting at zero and ending at zero. Because the original graph is continuous and differentiable, this purple graph is continuous and differentiable. And because of that, Rolle's theorem tells us that there must be a point right there where the derivative is zero. Now, if we look on up at the graph right here and try to visualize right there, I'll pop it up in a second, it's very clear that that's where the tangent line would be parallel. And so there we can see right at that point where g of x has a horizontal tangent line, the actual graph, f of x, has the special tangent line right here in green that is parallel to the secant line. So let's do a quick multiple choice question here. At which point does the tangent line illustrate the mean value theorem? What do you think it is? a, b, c, or d? Give it a try. 
So if we go ahead and draw the secant line, it looks something like that. Now clearly the tangent line at A is not going to work out. We're going to have a, a very vertical tangent line, something, something almost crazy like that at A. Maybe I'll draw that over a little bit. Something like, something like this. And again, I don't know about um, C and D. They look a little bit off. But if we tried to draw a tangent line over at B, I think the tangent line at B would be pretty parallel to the secant line. And I, I would argue that B would be the correct answer here. That at B, the secant line and the tangent line are parallel. C, the point C here just looks a little bit too shallow, and the point D is definitely too shallow. And so there's always going to be some point where we have the tangent line parallel, uh, but it takes a little bit of effort to visualize maybe where that point is. Now, as an analogy for you, there's a very interesting uh, problem that happens when you're driving down the highway. And so let's say you're in your car and you're driving down the highway and you would have the following, let's say, distance versus time graph. So here you go, you're driving, maybe you speed up sometimes, and then you slow down, and, and you get something like that. Well, what you could do is you could calculate the secant line. We could go ahead and draw a line from the beginning to the end of your trip, something like this. And the slope of that secant line would be equal to your average speed. So the slope here. Will be equal to your average speed. Which makes sense. If you look at the total distance you drove over the total time, that would give you your average speed. But let's say your average speed was equal to 120 kilometers per hour. Here's the question. Do you deserve a ticket? Do you deserve a ticket. Well, the speed limit, the maximum speed limit in Manitoba is 110. And so someone might argue, well, yeah, your average speed was over the speed limit. Of course you deserve a ticket. But you might argue, where? How do you know I deserve a, a ticket? All you know is my average speed. It's as if there was uh, a police officer who watched you leave your home and took the time that you left. And then there was another police officer who watched you arrive at your def destination and then took the time that you arrived. And then a mathematician behind them went ahead and calculated your average speed by taking the two times, the time you left home and the time you arrived at your destination, taking the total distance that it takes to traverse that distance and uh, dividing the two. If they come up with a number 120, well, they would argue that your average speed is above the speed limit, so you need a ticket. But you would argue, where? You weren't out there. You didn't see me driving. How do you know that I deserve a ticket? And the answer, of course, is the mean value theorem. Because you might say, where was I driving 120 kilometers an hour? You don't know that that was my speed. And the police officer can say to you, well, here's the thing. Your average speed was 120, which means that at some point along the trip, your derivative, your instantaneous speed, must have been equal to 120 kilometers an hour. I don't know where it happened, but I know that it had to have happened because by the mean value theorem, there's some point where your tangent line is parallel to your secant line. And so if your secant line is 120, your tangent line must have been 120, which means you were speeding, and yes, you deserve a ticket. By the mean value theorem, you deserve a ticket. Now, you might think this is a bit of a silly example, but actually in the United States, this is something that is practiced in law enforcement. What police officers will do is, let me just move this over. What police officers will do in the States is they'll be in a helicopter, and here will be the road. And there'll be a big solid line. And then over here there'll be another solid line. And so they're up high in the sky in a helicopter. And they're looking down. And what they have is a little stopwatch. And they're looking for a car to cross this line. Then they time the stopwatch. And they wait until the car passes this line over here. 
they take the time and they find the total time. Pretty easy to do with a stopwatch. And they look at the total distance. Usually this is one mile. And if the total distance divided by the total time is greater than the speed limit, then there's going to be another little cop car down over here who's going to pull this person over and give them a ticket. Even though they never had a radar gun, even though there was never a single point where they knew, oh, were they speeding over here or were they speeding over here? We don't know where they're speeding. All we know is that they were speeding, and that's good enough to give them a ticket. So it's interesting here, a nice application of math. If you're looking to go into law enforcement, you can use the mean value theorem. Uh, if you're looking to uh, avoid the cops, though, I don't know if this is going to help you. So let's try a concrete example with some algebra. Let's let fx be x cubed plus 2x plus 1 on the interval 0 to 2. Let's show that f of x satisfies the conclusion of the mean value theorem. Now remember, we need a continuous and differentiable function, and we need a number c in the end, where the derivative is equal to the secant line. Well, clearly we have a polynomial, so clearly it's continuous and differentiable. So let's go ahead and find the derivative, if we want, and the slope of the secant line. So f prime of x would be 3x squared plus 2. And f of b, so f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2 minus 0. f of 2 is going to be 8 plus 4 plus 1, so that'll be 13 f of 0 will be 1, so we're going to have 12 over 2, so 6. Now we set these equal to each other, so 3x squared plus 2 equals 6, 3x squared equals 4, x squared equals 4 over 3, and so x equals the square root of 4 over 3, which you could write as 2 over root 3, or if you want to approximate it, it's 1.15 which is clearly in the interval 0 to 2. So we found our point that's in the interval where the derivative, the slope of the tangent line, is equal to the slope of the secant line. Let's look at this example. We're going to let fx equal the absolute value of x minus 1 on the interval 0 to 3. We're going to show it does not contradict the mean value theorem. Well, when we go ahead and find the slope of the secant line, f of 3 minus f of 0, 3 minus 0. So absolute value 3 minus 1 minus absolute value 0 minus 1 over 3. So it'll be 2 minus 1, so 1 third. f prime of x. Well, again, this is a little tricky. We should maybe write f of x first because we need to find the derivative of uh, piecewise. So f of x will either be equal to x minus 1 or negative x minus 1, depending on if x is greater than or equal to 1 or if x is less than 1. So when we do the derivative, we get either 1 or negative 1, depending if x is greater than 1 or x is less than 1. So clearly, this is never equal to one-third. It's either one or negative one. These are never equal. But that's okay. The theorem does not apply in this case. The reason why this does not contradict the mean value theorem is because fx is not differentiable. at x equals to 1. That's going to be the point of that v on that absolute value graph. And so the theorem does not apply. Does not apply. I'll give you an analogy here for why the theorem doesn't apply and how you could think about it in terms of logic. Let's say you have a theorem at home um, Maybe this was your theorem living at home, maybe it wasn't, but let's say this is the theorem that, that happens at your house. We'll call it the parent's theorem. So the parent theorem. So around mealtime, your parents say, if you finish your food, if you finish your food, then 
you can have dessert. Well, the way the parents' theorem works is that if you finish your food, then you can have dessert. But if you don't finish your food, then there's no guarantee you're going to get dessert. In this situation, we didn't have a continuous and differentiable function. So there's no guarantee we're going to get our dessert. There's no guarantee we're going to get the slope of the secant line equaling to the tangent line. And that's because we didn't meet the initial condition. Now, does it happen sometimes that this flukes out? Of course. Sometimes at home, if you don't finish your food, are your parents nice to you and they might just give you dessert anyways? Yeah, it happens sometimes. And so it's not to say that sometimes there won't be fluke situations where this does work out. But the point is that the guarantee, the theorem is about the guarantee. If you have a continuous and differentiable function, aka finishing your food, then you get the final dessert. You get f prime of c equaling to the slope of the secant line. But if you don't finish your food, there's no guarantee you're going to get to apply the theorem. Now I want us to explore a bit of the power of the mean value theorem. And to do so, we'll look at a couple of theorems that use the mean value theorem. In this first proof, if f prime of x is equal to 0 for all x in the interval a to b, if the derivative is always 0, then you can prove that the function must be a constant function. So how do we do this? Well, let's suppose f prime x is equal to 0 for all x in the interval a to b. Now, the problem is that we can't apply the mean value theorem because of these round brackets. We need to get rid of the round brackets and make them square because the mean value theorem says we have to have a continuous function on a square interval. So what we're going to do is consider a subinterval. Consider x1, x2, a subinterval of a to b. Now, by a subinterval, what I mean is if this is your interval a to b, oh, I shouldn't put an arrow there to b. Well, we're going to look at a little interval x1 to x2 that's inside of the interval. It's a, it's a subinterval. It's a smaller interval inside the big interval. So the little subinterval x1 to x2 is inside of ab. And what can we say about that? Well, since fx is differentiable on ab, Since fx is differentiable on a to b, fx is differentiable on the subinterval x1 to x2. But if you remember, if a function is differentiable, then it has to be continuous. So, which implies... fx is continuous on x1 to x2. Well, if we have a function that is continuous and differentiable, then we can apply the mean value theorem. So by the mean value theorem, MVT for short, there exists a c in the subinterval x1 to x2 such that f prime of c equals well f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1 but f of prime of x if we look back over here is always equal to 0 so f prime of c is always equal to 0, because c is just any number in the subinterval, which means c is any number from a to b. If the derivative is always 0, then certainly at c the derivative is 0. So that means this whole thing is 0. But something is only ever 0 when the numerator is 0. So we could say, of course, since x2 is not equal to x1, f of x2 
minus f of x1 must be equal to 0, or f of x2 equals f of x1. We just move the x, f of x1 to the other side. Well, if f of x2 equals f of x1, that's the definition of a constant function. A constant function is where the y values are the same. So the y values are the same at x1 and x2, and since this is any subinterval, uh, we just have to state a little bit more, and we're almost done. So we have the following. But x1 comma x2 is any subinterval on a to b. Thus, f of x1 is equal to f of x2 for all x1, x2 in the interval a to b. Therefore, f of x, this is the definition of a constant function, so we can say f of x is constant on a to b. Now the example in the homework got cut off, so I'm going to put those on the next slide. So for an example, we're going to show that fx equal to sine inverse plus cos inverse is a constant function. Well, let's find the derivative. Derivative of sine inverse, if you remember, is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And the derivative of cos inverse is just the negative. Well, when you take something and it's negative and add it together, you get 0. So f prime of x is equal to 0. So by the previous theorem, it doesn't really have a name, so we'll just call it the previous theorem. fx is a constant function. So for homework, you can try the following. For homework, show fx equal to secant inverse of x plus cosecant inverse of x is a constant function. Now I'm going to show you the previous one on Desmos because it just looks so cool. So we're going to look at this on Desmos. So if you look here in red we have sine inverse and if you look here we have cos inverse in blue. And if we add the two functions together we get, look at that, that beautiful perfectly constant green line. Which kind of makes sense if you look on the right hand side it's all sine x and cos x, cos inverse, I should say, is down at zero. In the middle, they're kind of adding up. Over here at the y-intercept, we're going to have it all being cos inverse. And then down here, there's some negative on the sine inverse, but there's more positive on the cos inverse. And again, they kind of even out perfectly to give a constant function. So we'll look at one more theorem here, highlighting the power of this mean value theorem. If f prime and g prime are equal to each other for all x in the interval a to b, then f of x minus g of x is a constant function on a to b. Let's see how we would do this. So we're going to suppose that f prime x equals g prime x for all x in the interval a to b. And let's let capital fx equal f of x minus g of x. Well, if we find the derivative of capital fx, that's just going to be f prime x minus g prime x. Well, if they're the same, of course, this is just equal to 0 for all x in the interval a to b. Okay, well, by the previous theorem, By the previous theorem, f, capital F of x, because capital F of x, its derivative is always zero, 
then capital F of x must have been a constant function to begin with. Capital F of x, which is equal to f of x minus g of x, is a constant function on AB. And there you go. Short and sweet, we have our proof. So let's do a quick example of this. Look at these two functions, f of x equal x squared plus 7 and g of x equal x squared minus 2. Well, if we were to find the derivative, we would get 2x, and the derivative over here would also be 2x. So notice they have the same derivative. Well, if we were to subtract the two functions, fx minus g of x, we would get x squared plus 7 minus x squared minus 2, which would be x squared plus 7 minus x squared plus 2. The x squareds would cancel, and you'd get 9, which is constant. So indeed, we got a constant function when we subtracted the two functions. So for homework, uh, you've already done a few of these, uh, so you don't have to start at 5. You can start at 11, so do 11 to 17, and then 19. Now we're going to look at just a couple clickers before we end. If f of x is equal to g of x for all x, then which of the following is true? f of x equals 0, g of x equals 0, f prime x equals g prime x, or does not equal g prime x. So take a second to think about it. All right, this is a bit of a strange question, but I'm just trying to see if you're paying attention. If two functions are equal, then of course their derivatives are equal. You just do the derivative of both sides. So the answer would be D. Okay, if two functions have the same derivative, if f prime x equals g prime x, then fx equals g of x. Is this true? Always true, sometimes true, or not sure? Well, for this one, the answer would be sometimes. There are many functions, just like the ones we just did. If we had our example in front of us before, x squared plus 7 and x squared minus 2. Clearly those two functions have the same derivative, but they're not equal. But you could have two functions that are just x squared and x squared. Both of those would have derivative 2x, and they would be equal. So it happens sometimes, but it's not a guarantee. So if f prime x equals 5x to the 4 plus cos x, what is fx? Hmm, this is an interesting question. This is something we're going to look at more in a future video. If we know the derivative, can we go back and find the original function? This is different from what we've maybe done before. Normally we have the function and we look for the derivative. Well, simply, we could do the multiple choice question here. If this was fx, the derivative would be 20x to the 3 minus sine x, so that's not going to be right. In this case, the derivative of this one would be 20 plus, no, negative cos x. In this case, the derivative would be 5x to the 4 plus cos x. In this case, the derivative would be 60x squared minus cos x. So clearly the answer is C, because it's got the right derivative. But it raises the question of, if you didn't have these as your multiple choice options, and the only thing you had was this, would there be a way to go from here to here using kind of backwards derivatives, using some type of method, using some type of way to undo a derivative? So we'll look at that in a future video, but it's something to think about for now. Uh, until then, make sure you practice the mean value theorem. And as always, thanks for watching.